does amazing things. Well, welcome to Mountain Bible Church this morning, and uh, I'd like to have you guys turn to one another and shake a hand. Now that you're all in here and awake, uh, welcome somebody next to you. Good morning, good morning, church family. If you want to take a seat, I have a few announcements this morning. God does do great things all the time, doesn't he? One great thing I'm just going to talk about right now is this weekend, Daniel was here at the church with over 100 students. And yes, that is a great thing. And his topics were amazing and what the kids needed to hear. So I just want you guys to keep praying for these kids, Daniel and his team, all the youth leaders in Payson, because we know what happens now. 
And so they need our prayers. They need us to come around them. But Daniel will share in a couple weeks about uh, everything that went on this weekend. I was here for a couple hours yesterday, and it was just awesome. The kids were amazing. Daniel's team, Daniel's doing such a great job here with our youth. So, yes, yes. And for those who don't know me, my name is Felicia Moore. I am the children's pastor here at Mountain Bible, and I want to welcome you here this morning. If you are a first-time guest, there's a card in the seat back in front of you. If you want to just fill that out, it's a way for us to get information on you and then take it out to the kiosk. The lovely ladies have a coffee mug for you and a lot of information about the church. We have so many great things going on here at Mountain Bible. You can also look at your bulletin and go to the front office if you have any more questions about what's going on here. And staff, we're right now going, what do we do? What do we do? There's so many things going on at church right now. God is blessing this church and all of you and us. So make sure you check out our bulletin for information. A couple more announcements. Last week, you guys, um, we had our giving for a turkey. And the giving was 13815 All of that money will, yes, you are so gracious. Um, all that money will go to the Bocheks for their ministry in Turkey to help those through the, the, um, the relief for the earthquake. Today is VBS meeting. Just a reminder for those who want to have a great lunch with me after second service. <laughs> And learn about VBS. Last year we had 115 kids that were here every single day. Um, it was such a blessing. But it does take over 60 volunteers to make that week happen. So please, if you have any, want any information or questions, come to lunch after second service with me. And also, then a reminder, Pastor Dave talked last week about the prayer cards that he, uh, for everybody to have. They're out in the foyer today. And we just want to encourage you to grab one of these cards. And on the back, you can write down people's names that you can be praying about to invite to church for Easter. We all know we all need Jesus. And the best way to get somebody to come to church if they've never come is they need an invitation. So make sure you're writing down those names and praying about it and bring people to church on Easter Sunday. Now I get the privilege of introducing Jim Baugh. He is going to share about his ministry. Good morning. So good to be at Mountain Bible, and uh, I'll make sure my time is, is kept. So my name is Jim. My wife and I have been married for 41 years. We've been involved in Global Training Network for the last 15. And Global Training Network exists to train and equip pastors internationally so they can train and equip their own people. You know, the need is great. Um, God is moving around the world. You probably didn't hear this news on CNN. I think CNN, Christian News Network? No, it's not. <laughs> Every day around the world, 77,000 people meet Jesus. Every single day. But the majority of people who are coming to faith in Christ are in what's called the majority world. And I, I'm just going to move through the slides really quick. I, I, we're going to have a luncheon afterwards, so I'd love to have you this afternoon to fill in the blanks. But uh, God is moving so powerfully in the majority world. We used to call it the third world. Every day in Africa, 10,000 people meet Jesus. Every day in South and Central America, 10,000 people. Every day in Asia, 10, uh, excuse me, 20 to 35,000 people meet Jesus. And uh, God is moving, but that means there's a great need. And the great need is for leadership development. Because pastors and leaders, thank God for those faithful church planners in the past, but every leader needs to be a learner, and learners, we just need to continue growing in our faith. And so uh, the, the need is so evident that John Stott Ministries tell us that the average pastor in the emerging world has a grand total of about five to ten minutes of theological training. It's kind of like going to a heart doctor and saying, how much training do you have on this procedure? And he says, well, five minutes, but there's always YouTube. You know what I mean? <laughs> and so we provide that training. I want to share with you some incredible things that are happening in Haiti as well as in Africa right now in Rwanda. Uh, during COVID, remember that? Or are you trying to forget COVID? Yeah. During COVID, I did training online with a pastor in Haiti. And told him, on every level of discipleship, you have to disciple at least three other people to move on to the next level. 
Well, he did that, and he's equipped about 75 pastors. Over 3,300 people have been impacted by the discipleship ministries. And I'm going to be going to Dominican Republic in May because we can't get into Haiti. In Rwanda, the same is true. We began training pastors uh, in Rwanda, and they had to equip at least three people after every training in order to move on to the next level. Well, those 50, there'll soon be 65 pastors trained in, uh, we call it DTP, Discipleship Training Program, have impacted over 3,300 lives with the, mes- the mission of the, the ministry of the gospel and discipleship, as well as uh, incorporating cruise ministry with the Jesus film. Have you heard of the Jesus film? I think there's some person here who works with crew, and I thank God for crew, but Crew recruited us to uh, train and equip pastors using the Jesus film on tablets. We call it tab evangelism. And uh, as a result of having these individuals trained in Rwanda, there's been over 300 people who have met Jesus using the tablets. And many of them are Muslim uh, women. Very quickly, a report of a Muslim woman coming to faith. Her husband says, I don't want you to have anything to do with this evangelist anymore. He gets sick. And the imams, the shamans, the witch doctors, they cannot heal him, but Jesus can. And so he asked that this evangelist would come and pray with him, and God healed him, not only physically, but also spiritually. He met Jesus as his Savior and Lord. God is moving powerfully around the world, and I want to say thank you to Mountain Bible for praying for us, for partnering with us so that Jesus' name might be known around the planet and his glory might be experienced as his salvation might also be known. Thank you so much for your support and partnership. God bless you. And we're going to pray. Let's commit our morning to the Lord. Father, in Jesus' name, I thank you, God, so much for Mountain Bible Church. I thank you for their ministry, their impact not only locally but globally, and I pray that it would continue. May your name, Jesus, be exalted through this time this morning and for the rest of this day and this week. May the name of Jesus be proclaimed through our mouths and our lives. In Christ's name, God's people said, amen. Awesome. Thank you, Jim. You guys can stand. We're going to continue to praise the Lord.
with us. I'm going to pray as we start our service here today. God, thank you so much for what you are about to do. Lord, we ask that in this time as we're here to worship you, to, to minister to you, Lord, and to be ministered to by your spirit, God, we ask that you truly would speak in a mighty way through Billy today, that it would be your spirit moving us nearer and nearer to yourself, God. We need you, Lord. We love you. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. 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 Good morning. Great to worship with you guys today. Man, what a way to start the day, huh? Worshiping the Lord, hearing about all that God is doing across the world and bringing people to Christ all across the, the globe. What a great way to start the day. What an encouraging way to start the day. Hey, um, just real quick, as I was walking in into the sanctuary, I found this on the floor, which means one of you guys doesn't have the card to write the names on and to be praying for. So there are more out there. Grab one. Take these seriously, guys. Let's, let's use these as a catalyst to remind us to be praying, to be intentional for the next few weeks leading up to Easter. All right? Let's, let's be intentional about, about bringing somebody with us, praying for somebody, and inviting somebody uh, to church with us for Easter. And, and that being said... I just, we, we need to kind of make, take note of the fact that we've been pretty full both services for the last 
several weeks, many, many weeks actually, uh, in a row consecutively. So I know you like your seat a lot. I, I know you, you like it a lot, and I get it. For some of you, there's certain reasons you sit where you sit, and it just can't, you can't move. For the rest of you, on Easter, let's just be preparing that maybe we could squeeze away from the aisles so that it's easier for those who are coming later and visiting to, to find a place to sit, okay? Just a little plug. Just want to throw that out there. Um, it is getting full. Next year, the vision is we're going to rent the high school auditorium, and we'll do it all one service together and worship all together at the high school auditorium for Easter. Yeah, amen. That'll be fun. That'll be a lot of fun. We never get to all worship together, so that'll be, that'll be fantastic. Um, Hey, we're going to jump back into our, our Acts study this morning. We're going to pick up in Acts chapter 6, verse 8. Last week, Pastor Dave brought us all the way through verse 7, where we saw the, the church experiencing some growing pains. The church was experiencing some, some adjusting and, and, and needing to kind of flex as it was growing. Pastor Dave told us the numbers are estimated to have been about Twenty-five to 30,000 believers at that point in time there locally in Jerusalem. And, and, and as part of what they had done as a, as a fledgling church, they were taking care of one another and especially those widows among them. And, and so as they would distribute food and, and things for the widows, there, there, dis, there arose a dispute you know, the, between the Hellenistic Jewish widows and the Hebrew Jewish widows And the Hellenistic widows just felt like they weren't being uh, given as much care as the Hebrews. And so this this became a a big enough issue that it it came before the apostles. The apostles met and prayed about it, and they said, hey, here's what we're going to do. You guys pick from among you those that are full of the Spirit, those that are full of faith and wisdom that will take care of these needs. And so they, they brought forth seven different men, godly men, and they prayed over them, and those men became essentially the first deacons of the church to, to serve as it pertained to mostly the practical needs of the church. And Stephen was one of those seven chosen. And we'll pick up this morning in verse 8, six, chapter 6, verse 8. And Stephen, full of faith and power, did great wonders and signs among the people. Great powers or great wonders and signs among the people. I love this. Stephen, we haven't heard of Stephen up to this point. He was probably already serving and and loving God and loving people. That's why he was chosen among those first few. But here now, as Stephen steps into just a, a really committed role of service, we see the Holy Spirit blessing him and working through him powerfully in the same kind of way he was using those apostles. Pastor Dave touched on this a little bit last week, that sometimes in the church we have this, this, this thought, or, or we sort of think of the church in, in terms of, of corporate leadership. You know, there's, a, there's, there's the, this pyramid, and the, the most important are at the top, and then as you work your way down the, the hierarchy, the less important are at the bottom. But that's not how the church works. That's not how God set the church up. I've actually heard, not in this church, thank God, but I've actually heard deacons in other churches say about themselves, well, I'm just a deacon. And I, and I thought, why would you say I'm just a deacon like that? Why, why, would, it, why would you feel in some way that this is a, some lesser position or maybe it's not as valuable or why would, that, why would you feel the need to say it in that way? And I think it's because we often think of the church in terms of, of sort of a hierarchy and, and different things. And sure, there's structure and there's roles. But in the body of Christ, we are just that. We are a body. There, we're not a pyramid of, 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 of importance. We're a body. And in order for a body to be fully functioning and healthy, all the parts need to be fully functioning and healthy, right? And, and so uh, I want us to, to remember this, that Every one of us plays an important role. Every one of us is part of this this local body, and we're needed and we're necessary. And as we step fully into that understanding, we'll begin to see God work more powerfully and more mightily through each one of us, just as we see here in Stephen. I love it. But as is always the case, when the church is growing, 
when we're moving mightily in faith, there will be opposition. We'll experience opposition. That's what we see here. Look at verse 9. Then there arose some from what is called the synagogue of the freedmen, Cyrenians, Alexandrians, and those from Cilicia and Asia, disputing with Stephen. And they were not able to resist the wisdom and the spirit by which he spoke. Then they secretly induced men to say, we have heard him speak blasphemous words against Moses and God. And they stirred up the people, the elders and the scribes, and they came upon him, seized him, and brought him to the council. They also set up false witnesses who said, this man does not cease to speak blasphemous words against this holy place and the law. For we have heard him say that this Jesus of Nazareth will destroy this place and change the customs which Moses delivered to us. And all who sat in the council, looking steadfastly at him, saw that he was red-faced and furious. No, that's not it. If you're reading your Bible, you know. (laughs) Saw his face as the face of an angel. Isn't that amazing? Think about this. This is the same group of people who, who sees Jesus, arrested Jesus, accusing him of the same types of things and ultimately condemned him to death. So this is not a, a, a small thing. This is not a light thing that, that Stephen is experiencing. He's, he's been brought in and serious charges leveled against him. And, and as they looked at him, they're, they're charging him and these false witnesses are, are coming against him. And they're looking steadfastly at him. Why? Because his face is that of an angel. He, he's calm. He's, he's at peace. He's, he's at rest. He's, he's not shaking with anger. He's not just waiting for, to jump on them when, they, when they're silent. He's at peace. Amazing. Amazing. These guys, we don't, we don't know much about this synagogue of the freedmen. But, but they, they, they came against Stephen, surely thinking that they would be able to silence this uneducated Jesus follower. Thinking, oh, well, we can shut this guy down, surely. And yet he was so filled with the Spirit and, and so filled with wisdom that they just weren't able to trap him in his words. They weren't able to silence him. And, and so they resorted to deception, which is the same thing they did to Jesus. Finding, drumming up false witnesses. And verse 9 tells us that some of those from the synagogue of the freedmen were from Cilicia, which is interesting because you may remember that the apostle Paul was from Cilicia. And and we'll see in this passage and in chapter 7 that there's a man named Saul. And we know the apostle Paul was Saul before before the Lord changed his name. And most likely we're, we're seeing here Saul a Pharisee that was well known for his zeal in in stamping out these Christ followers was very likely one of these men from this synagogue. Interesting. And he saw Stephen's face as that of an angel. He witnessed this, this this peace. What an incredible witness for Christ we see here. I love this. Stephen didn't invite this dispute with these guys, he was just loving people. He was just loving people to Christ. He was just serving the Lord and, and, and sharing the good news of Jesus. And, and as he did so, some were riled up. Those who you would think might, might be excited about this message, might be excited about the Messiah, but they weren't. They weren't excited about it. We'll talk about that in a little bit. And Pastor Dave talked about this a little bit last week, that that we need to expect that if we're living for Christ, if we're, if we're bold in our faith, that we're going to experience some opposition. There are going to be those who come against us. There are going to be those who are stirred up by us. There are going to be those who want us to stop talking, to be silent. And we need to make sure in, that, in those moments that we're responding in a way that's godly. Because that's going to speak louder than in the words that we're saying. The demeanor, the, the look on our face, the body language, the way that we carry ourselves in those moments is, is going to be powerful. And it will speak. 
And, and even if the words we're saying are right, if the demeanor is wrong, if, the, if we're clenching our teeth and, and, and gritting our teeth and, and clenching our fists and, and we're, we're starting to shake and we're starting to get angry and we're, we're, st- we're turning red and that kind of thing, that's what they're going to hear. That's what they're going to see. They're not going to see the love of God. They're not going to experience the love of Christ. They're not going to experience the grace that is found in Him. They're, they're going to see our sin they're going to see that, that we're that our, our fleshly inclinations. The Apostle Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians 13 that it, it doesn't matter what we do, whether we're giving all that we have to feed the poor or we're sacrificing of ourselves in, in various ways, it doesn't matter if we're doing all these things. If the motivation in our heart is not love, I'm doing these things because I have a love for the people that I'm, that I'm ministering to, that I'm giving to, if that's not my motivation, Paul says it's empty. It's, it's clanging brass. It's, it's clanging cymbals. It's, it's just noise. It is, it is so important that as Christ followers, all that we do and that we say is motivated by, is, is compelled by the love of God. Or we won't, we won't be preaching the right message. We won't be sending the right message to those that we're interacting with. It's the love of God that draws us to Him. That's what draws us to the Lord. It's, it's God's love that, that pulls us in, that draws us in, that compels us. And it's going to be His love flowing through us that compels others to hear us. That gives us a voice in their lives. So let's see what Stephen had to say when they gave him a chance to speak. Look at uh, verses, uh, verse 1 and 2 of 7, chapter 7. Then the high priest said, are these things so? Speaking of those, those accusations, he blasphemed Moses and the law and the temple. And Stephen said, brethren and fathers, listen. Listen. Now the issue is here. Are these things so? What they're asking is, are you really trying to diminish the temple, the importance of the temple? Are you trying to diminish Moses? Are you, are you saying that we don't need the law any longer? What, what is it that, that, you, that you're about here, Stephen? What is it you're trying to do? And this was the same issue they had with Jesus. These are the same things they said about Jesus. Why? Because they were, they were holding so tightly to their power and their systems and their traditions that they were threatened by any change, any thought of change, any thought of, of loosening their grip and letting go of what they had held so tightly to. Their, their system, their traditions, their, their faith had sort of degenerated into nothing more than, than the, uh, this system. They, they weren't walking with God. They missed, Jesus told them over and over, you're missing the whole point. You, you're, you're straining at a, at a gnat at all the while swallowing a camel, Jesus said. You've become so focused on all of these little minor details that are really not that important that you're missing the heart of God. And that's what had happened to these, these individuals. It had become rules and regulations and, and, and all about their control and maintaining power. And so when Stephen was given a chance to speak in front of this religious council, he said to them, brethren and fathers, listen. And then he goes on to give a lengthy but very accurate history of the people of Israel. This, this lengthy lesson, history lesson of the people of Israel. And the purpose of his lesson was for them to see that throughout their history, the Lord had always moved in unexpected ways through unlikely people in unexpected places. And they had always rejected the ones that God sent. 
He, he wanted them to see as he, as he gave them this lesson. Look, God's always moved in, in unexpected places. He's always moved through people we, didn't, we, wouldn't, we wouldn't expect him to move through. And he's always moved in places that, that, we, that, were, that were unlikely. This is how God's moved throughout our history. And we've always rejected his moving. We've always, we've always resisted what he was trying to do. And so for the sake of time, I'm going to summarize a good portion of this next section because really we covered a lot of it as we went through the book of Genesis just recently. So we're going to kind of summarize some of this. <clears throat> so verses uh, verse 2 through 36, in this first part of Stephen's speech, Stephen reminds them that Abraham was in a pagan land. He was a pagan worshiper. When God called him, out of his land to follow the Lord. Abraham had no godly heritage. Abraham wasn't a, a, a noble, holy man. And God gave him this incredible promise that he would make a nation of his descendants. And Abraham chose to believe God and walk by faith with the Lord. Then Stephen points to Joseph, who also loved God and worshiped him in a foreign land with no temple, with, with no law, with no, no priests, no, no go-between. Jacob was, or Joseph was in a foreign land, loving God, walking with him by faith in relationship to him. And like Jesus, he was rejected by the sons of Israel. And then to Moses, who the religious leader was accusing Stephen of speaking against, Moses was also not in the, the, the holy city of Jerusalem, he, 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 when God called him, and when he chose to walk with the Lord, he was among foreigners. And Moses was also rejected by his people. You'll remember that, that when uh, he, he rose up to protect one of his fellow Hebrews, he, he got a little zealous and he, and he killed an Egyptian. And then he, he thought that, that God was going to use him at that, in that way to lead the people. And the people rejected him and said, oh, what are you going to do? Are going to kill us too? And he was, he was rejected by his people. Stephen was making this point again, that God worked miraculously in all of their patriarchs who they held in high esteem, not according to a system, but according to a, a relationship. They walked with God by faith, not by sight. Not because they had this, this law or this temple or they were in the holy land or, or any of that, but by faith they walked with God. This is the point he's making. Not only that, but that throughout their history, again, they had routinely rejected those who God raised up. The next section, verses 37 through 50, Stephen continues that Moses told them that there would be another who would come like him. Another who, who God would raise up, another prophet, who God would work miraculously through, and, and he's speaking of none other than Jesus. And Stephen tells them, they're gonna, that, that our, we reje we're going to reject him too. We already rejected him too. You should hear him. And so he's going through this history of Israel. And then he says, that it wasn't even God's idea that a temple be made in the first place. Solomon built the temple. Solomon dedicated the temple. And as he dedicated the temple, Solomon said, the Lord can't live here. He called it the house of God, but he said, the Lord can't live here in this tangible place. He says in verses 48 through 50, the Most High does not dwell in temples made with hands. As the prophet says, heaven is my throne and earth is my footstool. What house will you build for me, says the Lord? Or what is the place of my rest? Has my hand not made all these things? See, as human beings, we like systems. We like boxes to check. We like tangible relics and, 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 and things that we can sort of elevate and, and look to. We like the traditions. We like to, to know what's coming and know how things go and, and all of that. We, that. That appeals to us. 
so that I can say, okay, well, I checked this box, and I checked this box, and I checked this box. I guess I'm good. Okay, I did my deed for the day. Uh, I'm good. God, God, now you've got to bless me. I did my, my part. Now you do your part. But that's not what God's called us to. He's called us to faith. He's called us to a relationship, a daily walk with Him. We, we don't have the checklist that we can say, okay, did it, did it, did it, did it, did it? Okay, rest of the week, I'm fine. No, it's a daily walk with the Lord that He's called us to. It's a relationship with Him through His Son, Jesus, that He's called us to. It's like the manna that was on the ground as they wandered in the wilderness for for those 40 years. You had to pick it up each day fresh and new. You couldn't save it for the next day except on the Sabbath. You couldn't save it. You had to to get it every day fresh. That's, That's a picture of how we need the Lord. We need the Lord fresh every day. We need to walk with Him and take in of His Word and spend time with Him on a daily basis in order to be healthy believers. It's not about systems. To place our hope and focus in in systems and traditions is is kind of like, it's kind of like having a photo of a loved one that we cherish and we hold on to, and yet the loved one's here in our midst, and, and, and we still continue to stare at the photo. And, and pour over the photo and look at the photo and, oh, I just, it's so wonderful and I just, I, I carry it with me all the time and, and, and the loved one's in the room and, and the loved one's going, I'm right here, what are you doing? This is weird, why are you so focused on this, these symbols and these pictures of me rather than just walking with me, rather than just talking with me and looking to me? But that's so often what we do. We get caught up in in the tangible things, the things we can see and feel, and and we miss the point. So often that was the case with Israel, and so often that's the case for us as well. Well, at this point in Stephen's speech, his history lesson, as he's recounting their rejection of God, their resistance of the Holy Spirit, Stephen's getting pretty fired up at this point. So look at verses 51 through 53. He says, you stiff-necked, and uncircumcised in heart and ears, you always resist the Holy Spirit. As your fathers did, so do you. Which of the prophets did your fathers not persecute? And they killed those who foretold the coming of the just one, and of whom you now have become the betrayers and murderers, who have received the law by the direction of angels and have not kept it. He was exasperated. And he uses, he, he resorts to a phrase that they would be very familiar with, a phrase that, that God's prophets often use speaking of the nation of Israel. He says, you're a stiff-necked people. You can imagine that. You're a stiff-necked people. You're just, you're, you're resistant. If, if someone tries to move you or, or someone tries to, to direct you or change, you, change your direction, you're just, you're just stiff. You just won't, you won't move. You won't budge. You can't be pushed. You can't be coerced. You're a stiff-necked people. They wouldn't like that very much because they would know, oh, this is what the prophets said. This is how the prophets spoke to us. And in addition to calling them stiff-necked, he accused them of being uncircumcised in heart and ears, a phrase that would be equally as cutting, pardon the pun, (laughs) because they took great pride in their circumcision, which was handed down to them from their father Abraham. See, God had called his people to be separate. He called Abraham to, to be separate. He called him to, to, be, to be set apart. And he, and he called him to circumcision, which would be a, something that, would, that was peculiar. It was, just, it was just for them, those who followed God. But it was a symbol. It was a symbol. It would be a symbol, a picture of cutting away of the, of the, of the flesh, of of doing away with the the fleshly inclinations of the heart and becoming sensitive to the Lord. That was the point of it. And they missed the point. They just continually missed the point. They were so focused on, so so set upon these outward displays of religion that they missed the whole reason for why they did what they did. And this happens to us as well. If we're not careful, this happens to us. 
We can get so focused on silly little things that we miss the point of what God is trying to do. Years ago, sorry, I keep messing with this headset thing. They've, they've made me do it. It's Bobby's fault. Um, everything's Bobby's fault lately. Uh, years ago at our, our church in, in Louisiana, our stage was similar to this. It was a little bit higher, and we had these wings sort of like over here, and we would have communion just like we do here available, and people could come and take the communion. But we didn't have little elevated walls. The communion was just kind of on the floor because the stage was higher. And uh, I had a guy come up to me once, and he says, so tell me, Pastor, uh, what's the significance of, of putting the communion on the floor? And it was just his roundabout, passive-aggressive way of saying, you shouldn't have your communion on the floor. And, and I, just, I, I just said, well, there's no significance. It's just where we put it. You know, it's just the, it's just, it's just the convenient place to have it, you know. Uh, it's where people can walk up and take the communion. It's not that big of a deal, you know. But he was so hung up on it. He said, well, you got to, that's just not right. That's just not right. And I'm like, I said, do you know what the first communion looked like? It was just Jesus breaking a loaf of bread up and passing it around to the disciples. It was just a cup that they took a sip out of and passed it around. It was, it was not this formal thing. It was not this, this weird thing. It was, it was a, a casual thing. God has, has given to us this way to commune with him. But it was not something that we're to, we're to make that, the elements themselves, the big deal. It's the symbol. It's what it, it's what it stands for. It's what it points us to that matters. I had another guy come. And he said, uh, I'm kind of disturbed that the communion isn't covered. And I... I said, okay, I'm, I'm sorry that the communion's not, that that disturbs you, but why is that disturbing? He said, well, it's just supposed to be covered. It's just, that's, it's just supposed to be covered. And I, I just, well, I don't, where? How do you know that? Where's that written? <laughs> I don't, I, it's not in the scriptures. So where's that written, you know? Well, it's just how it's supposed to be. It's, it's just not right for it not to be covered. We get focused on these weird little things. And we let them be distractions to us, and we let them, we let them just be a problem for us, and we're missing the point. Uh, we, I, I have a good friend who had several teenage sons who were good kids, really great godly kids, serving in their youth group, helping in worship, you know, loving the Lord. And, uh, and, one, and one of them was a skateboarder. He's a skater. And he, he was in church one Sunday morning with a beanie on. And his dad was part of the worship team. And when the pastor came up on stage, and this family, they served the Lord, they served the church, they were so faithful in the church. When the pastor came up on the stage, he berated the father in front of the congregation for letting his son be so disrespectful to wear a beanie in the church. Talk about missing the point. Just missing the point. Why not be really excited that you have godly teenagers in the church? That you have teenagers that are excited about Jesus and serving. Why would you get caught up in silly little things like that? We, we, we elevate certain things in a way that just is, is not in keeping with the heart of God. And that's exactly what the religious leaders did. They were missing the point and they missed Jesus in the process. I had a conversation with a gal once at a, at a coffee shop. And we, ended, we were talking about the Lord. We, we started talking about Jesus, and I was sharing the gospel with her and, and, and hoping that she would uh, hear and, and come to church and, and meet the Lord and all that. And you know, she didn't walk with the Lord at all. She openly shared that she didn't walk with the Lord at all. Matter of fact, the conversation started because I was reading the newspaper, and she asked me for the horoscope section. And that's how the conversation started. And so she's, she, she wasn't walking with Jesus in any way whatsoever. And yet, you know the reason why she didn't go to church? She said, and this is a young gal. She said, you know, I just, people aren't, people don't, aren't serious enough about their, their Christianity anymore. And, you know, I see boats in the parking lot, people with boats hooked to their trucks in the parking lot. They, sh- they show up to church with their swim trunks on and they, you know, they just can't wait to get out of there and get to the lake and go skiing. And I thought, That's amazing. Like instead of skipping church, they made church a priority and then they went skiing after church. How is that a bad thing? 
But she, she had the, such a religious spirit that she wouldn't even go to church because the church didn't measure up to her standards. I thought that was the weirdest thing. I just thought that is the most bizarre thing. We miss the point if we're not careful. We miss the point. And so he says, you stiff-necked and uncircumcised in heart and ears. You're resisting the Holy Spirit. You resist. He says, you always resist the Holy Spirit. Let us be sensitive to the Holy Spirit and the leading of the Holy Spirit. Man, we don't ever want to become those people who maybe started out on the right path and then somehow got so focused on the wrong things that we miss the working, the fresh working of the Holy Spirit. Let us remain sensitive to the Holy Spirit and focused on those things that He's focused on and, and, and zealous about those things that He's zealous about and not the lesser things. Well, verse 54 tells us when they heard these things, they were cut to the heart and they gnashed at him with their teeth. But he being full of the Holy Spirit gazed into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God and said, look, I see the heavens opened and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. They knew that his assessment of them was right. They were cut to the heart. They knew that his assessment was right, but they didn't want to change. They didn't want to give up their systems. They didn't want to give up their control and their power. And so they gnashed their teeth at him. These were the dignified leaders of Israel. They gnashed their teeth at him. But he was, again, full of the Holy Spirit. I love the the contrast the whole time in this interaction. The contrast between Stephen and Stephen and these other individuals is so powerful because as they're gnashing their teeth at him, he's gazing up and he sees the Lord. His eyes are literally fixed on the Lord as they're gnashing their teeth at him. And this should be us, church. We're to be so filled with the Spirit, meaning we've spent so much time in the presence of God and we've, we're so yielded to the Spirit of God that we don't, we don't get riled up, we don't get all ugly and we don't get all, all caught up in silly arguments and silly things. We're just, we're, our eyes are fixed on the Lord. We're looking up. That should be us. I love that. And notice he says he sees Jesus standing at the right hand of God. Normally, we have the picture of Jesus seated at the, at the right hand of God. Here, Jesus is standing almost as if he's applauding Stephen. Almost as if he's saying, oh, Stephen, you're doing so well. Stephen, I'm, I'm with you. I stand with you, Stephen. You're, you're honoring me. I'm, I'm, I'm welcoming you, Stephen. And then they cried out, verse 57, with a loud voice, stopped their ears. I mean, look, they're like children. They're stopping their ears, gnashing their teeth, and they ran at him with one accord. And they cast him out into the city and stoned him. And the witnesses laid down their clothes at the feet of a young man named Saul, again, very probably Paul. And they stoned Stephen as he was calling on God and saying, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. And then he knelt down and cried out with a loud voice, Lord, do not charge them with this sin. And when he had said this, he fell asleep. Amazing. What must that have felt like for them? To hear Stephen's last words being almost the same as Jesus' last words. Lord, don't account this sin to them. He cries out with that. Lord, don't charge them with this sin just as Jesus had. I think this must have pierced Saul's heart. He's there. He's, he's taking care of the coats while they're, the others are doing the dirty work. And he hears Stephen do this and he sees his face as that of an angel. I think it must have pierced Saul's heart. He didn't want to admit it at that moment. He wasn't ready yet to, to confess and change and be converted. But he was, I believe he was pierced at that point. 
Here we have Stephen as the first martyr of the church. He's the first of those to give their lives for the sake of Jesus. The first of thousands and thousands and thousands. There are many today that are still giving their lives for the sake of Jesus Christ. All across the world, people are still being murdered for their faith in Jesus Christ. Stephen was the first of those. And what powerful love do we see here? Stephen didn't hold back the truth, not at all, but he did it in love. And again, that's got to be our heart. If we're going to enter into a, a conversation where we're speaking truth, it must be coupled with love. Because the scriptures don't divorce truth from love or truth from grace or truth from mercy. Truth, yes, but always in love, always in grace, always with mercy, always. If you give truth with love, it may be resisted, it may be rejected, you may be attacked as a result, but they're going to know it's true and it's right. And the Lord will use that in their lives moving forward. Our culture, our culture says, if you disagree with me, you hate me. If you disagree with me, you, you, you don't love me, you can't love me and disagree with me. And yet we know that's not true. We know that we absolutely can. We absolutely can disagree with all of the decisions that a human being, another human being makes and still love them. How do we know that? Well, if you're a parent, <laughs> your, your child can be in rebellion. Your kid can be doing all the wrong things. Maybe even to the point of you having to say, hey, I'm sorry, but you're not welcome in my home but I can still love you with all of my heart in speaking that truth to you. That's how God loves us. That's how God loves the world, every single person in it. And that's how God's called us to love as well. We're to speak truth, but it must be in love. I am so thankful that God wasn't afraid of hurting our feelings. That God was willing to say, unless you repent of your sin, you're going to die in your sin, and you're going to be separated from me for eternity. I'm so glad the Lord was willing to say it. What, what if the Lord said, well, I don't want to hurt their feelings. I don't want to I don't want to offend them. And just let us silently go to hell. No, he loves us enough to speak truth to us. Hard truth to us. Truth that hurts. I don't know about you, but as I read this book, I'm convicted a lot. I feel bad a lot about myself. And then I go, oh, thank you, God, that you died for me. Thank you, Jesus, that you already paid the price for that thing. Thank you, Lord. God, forgive me, fill me, change me. Truth is a good thing, but it must be coupled with love. I'll leave you with this. God doesn't call us to an institution. He doesn't call us to a system. He doesn't really call us to a religion. He calls us truly to a walk of faith in relationship with him through his son, Jesus Christ. That's what he calls us to. And, and when it's relationship, it's life-giving, it's exciting, it's comforting. And the result is, the closer I am to him, the more I look like him. When it's not relationship, when it's a system, when it's a, when it's a, a, a set of rules and regulations, when it's, when it's checking boxes, then I don't look anything like him. I'm critical and I'm judgmental and I'm petty and I cling to whatever little power I can get and I want to control things. It looks nothing like him. And so let's walk with the Lord. Let's let go of the silly things. Let's let go of the little things and let's walk in relationship with our God. And let me just let, finally say, if you're here this morning and you have been resisting the Holy Spirit, Jesus tells us the work of the Holy Spirit, the primary work of the Holy Spirit is to glorify Him. It's to draw people to Him. If you've been resisting that, if you've been stiff-necked, 
man, today is the day to recognize I need help. I can't do it on my own. I'm tired of doing it on my own. And I need help. He's reaching out his hand. He's reaching out his hand. He says, oh, come unto me, all you are weary and heavy laden, those who are burdened with the cares of this world and the trials of this world. Come to me. He says, I'll give you rest. I'll give you peace for your souls. It's found in, in first saying, Lord, forgive me. I repent, God. I've been going my own way. I've been doing my own thing. And I've made a mess and it's not working. God, I surrender my life to you. I believe, Jesus, that you died on the cross for my sins. I believe that you rose again on the third day. And the scriptures tell us that if we believe that and we confess that, that we will be saved. Amen? Lord, we thank you, God, that you have not left us on our own. You have not withheld the truth from us. You have not withheld your love from us. Lord, you've, 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 given, to your, you've given all of yourself to us. You've made yourself known to us in every way that you can. You've removed every barrier between us and you by sending your son Jesus to pay the price for our sins, to take upon himself the punishment that we deserve. Lord, thank you. Praise you, God, that you loved us enough to call us out of sin and into life. Lord, I pray for Mountain Bible Church that we would not get hung up on the insignificant things. Lord, that we would be free from legalism. We would be free from, from traditionalism that's, that's no longer honoring to you. We would be free from, from uh, uh, the, the rules and the regulations and the, the, the boxes to check Lord, that we just walk with you in relationship, hand in hand with you in relationship. And you will lead us and you will guide us and you will direct us through your word and by your spirit. Lord, most of us have some tinge of legalism in our hearts. We ask God that you would forgive us of any self-righteousness, of any, any desire to be right before you by our own strength and our own efforts. And you would call us back to total dependence on your righteousness, Lord. We praise you, Lord. We honor you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's stand. I count one thing same God that never fails when I fail me now He won't fail me now in the waiting the same God who's never late is working all things out you working all things out oh yes
are standing in your presence, Lord, that you would make that our prayer today. We would make that a commitment to you, even as we've turned our backs on you so many times, you've never forsaken us, Lord. And whether we're here with happy hearts or whether our hearts are heavy, God, I pray that you would help us to make that commitment to you. We love you, Lord. In your mighty name, amen. You guys have a great Sunday. We'll see you back next week.